I was always the type of person that, you know, had dreams of going to the United States and all the other, uh, what, you, what people tell you to go see, right? And I'd never, and I'll be 100% honest with you, I'd never considered traveling the African continent uh, as much as I want to right now, having experienced what's, what's out there. I think that young people today are seeing that, I think there was a, there was a generation, and uh, I hope the older generation doesn't, doesn't, doesn't uh, <laughs> come at me for this, but there's an older generation that, almost felt that they were inferior to maybe the West or the, 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 the UK or the other uh, foreign nations. They felt that they were we weren't as good maybe or smart enough or the, whatever the case was. Um, but the younger generation now sees uh, the US and goes, they're not smarter than us. They have more money, but they're not smarter than us. And so yeah. what, we, what, are, what are we doing as a generation? We, we are coming up with ideas and going, how can we still make it happen regardless of the fact that we don't have the millions of dollars that they have? And a lot of that is happening right now. There's that whole mindset shift where Africans are finally recognizing the power that we have as Africans as well, uh, as the younger generation. We're not waiting until we have permission to start a company or we have permission to do the next big thing to us. We are coming up with ideas and almost on the day executing them. Um, Hi, Ibavu. Ah, uh, how's it going? How are you doing, Akini? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, man. It's been quite a week, and uh, I just I've been looking forward to this the whole week as well. So, oh, I'm glad we're here. That's we good. That's good. <laughs> wow. How's yeah, how's yeah. Joburg? Um, I'm actually in Kigali at the moment. Uh, oh, Ru really? Yeah, yeah, Kigali in Rwanda. Oh, okay. By the way, um, so so prior to leaving South Africa uh, for the first time this year and coming to East Africa. I, I always thought that South Africa was this, uh, I don't want to say a pinnacle of the African <laughs> country, but I really had so many um, thoughts and about not obviously wanting to go anywhere else. And as soon as I came to Kigali, and uh, uh, until May actually, it was actually a four or five month trip until May, and then I decided to go back to South Africa. And while I was in South Africa, I was just like, no ways, I have to go back to East Africa, yeah. and I have to go back to Kigali. And I've been here ah. since June, July now. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if I told you when we when when we talk. Yeah. When I came to South Africa in twenty two twenty, what was it called now? Uh, two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. And yeah. then I was in Joburg for about uh, three four months. And then I we we moved to Nairobi. Yeah. See, the feeling I had when I was in Nairobi was very unique. See, yeah. the whole atmosphere of Nairobi just gave me chills. I loved this so much. Yeah. Yeah. You know? See, uh Africa, Africa has has some very beautiful cities, okay? And it does. Un until, until we start traveling within Africa, you know, to see, to see what we have, uh, we, might not, we might not appreciate what we have, you know? Yeah. No, so we won't. And, and, and I, I was always the type of person that, you know, had dreams of going to the United States and all the other, uh, what, you, what people tell you to go see, right? And I'd never, and I'll be 100% honest with you, I'd never consider traveling the African continent uh, as much as I want to right now, having experienced what's, what's out there. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's marvelous. It's marvelous. Yeah, yeah. And then we need, we need to do that. We need to travel within the continent yeah. to see what, what, what we have. Of anyway, course. Th thank you very much for being here. So tell me, just let's start. Uh, yeah. Introduce, your, introduce yourself to my audience. Tell them who you are and what you do. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so, Bavugile Vilane, I always uh, call it in full because mm -hmm. uh, um, when, I, when I used to say Bavu in school and my father uh, came to a, an honors evening, which is uh, where they give the prize giving. Yeah. And uh, he had the teacher say, uh, Bavu Vilane, come to the stage. And he, he said, no, that is not my son's name. Exactly. <laughs> he is Bavugile. 
Vilane. And so he didn't appreciate that I actually had shortened my name for a, a prize giving. So he, it's fine to, on the day to day, you know, with people that are you're so close to, to call you with your shortened name. Yes. But on a, on, a, on a ceremony like that, he thought or felt that they should at least embrace that, um, you know, the fullness of it. And so. Yes, that's, that's good. So that's very I good. I always lead with it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with people to call me Bavu. Uh, the only time I ever hear someone say Bavugile is when I'm in trouble with my mom as well, <laughs> back at home. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, just talking about all the other all the other stuff, I I would say I'm one of those unconventional people where uh, they, everyone said I must go this way, and I thought, why not take that way? Um, and there's just a just beautiful quote, I think, that I grew up um, seeing a lot of, and it's, it, it says, uh, I think it's, it's by Ralph Waldo Emerson. He says, don't go where the path may lead. You know, you know, you need to go where there is no path and then leave a trail behind you. And that's what I really wanted to do. And wow. so when everyone said, Bavu Kile, go study, I decided, no, I'm going to go straight into work and gain the, exper <laughs> like the, exper the experience and expertise that I want to have before even making a decision to go further mm. my education formally. Mm. And, and again, it's like, Bavu, do this. And I go, mm -mm, why can I not do it this way? And I've just always been one of those one of those people and uh i've had an, an opportunity to work in amazing you know companies i started off working in the automobile industry doing um finance and sales and marketing for vehicle finances i realized that corporate wasn't for me so i moved on on to working with smaller companies startups where i felt that i could make more of an impact um had the opportunity to work through you know covid etc and um I think where I am now is that I also, I finally found that that where, where I need to or want to go to. And I realized that um, regardless of having the business experience that I have, I wanted to gain the technical expertise as well. So I started okay. pursuing a, a, a software engineering degree, more part-time than full-time, really. I do it in the evenings. I do it whenever I have time while I do the other work I do. And um, I think that there's, the value in where I am now is the fact that I took enough years to see what I wanted to do, what I can contribute before jumping into a degree that I would have probably dropped out of by now. And so it's just something I've been telling people in my, you know, people around me, my classmates that are done now and don't know what to do. I'm like, you should have taken a few years to actually find yourself. And that's what I've done really well. Um, and all of that experience, all of those life experiences have led me to um, building or starting um, what's next which uh, is, I'm sure we'll go on and speak more about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk more um, about that. But I want to say, <laughs> uh, unique among yeah. young people, okay, because of this philosophy you have to yeah. explore things, find out what you actually want, okay? Yeah. That's very different from most young people, including me, okay? Mm. I jumped into into school because hey, that's what everybody expects me to do. Okay. Yeah. So I want you to tell us, my audience, my young audience, a little yeah. bit more about you. Okay. <laughs> How you come about those kind of ideas. Yeah. 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 No. So <laughs> goes back to my father great parenting for my father and really has has down and hats off to him uh he made us read as children he used to force us to read and when your father this african man is telling you to read 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 you don't understand it it, it, it i don't know for me it actually used to get to me i was like oh why is this man making us read i, I wish i wish my daughter <laughs> I, I wish my daughters can hear you now <laughs> <laughs> and i don't think for a moment i would have ever appreciated reading uh until i eventually f obviously found a love for it and then this, this is where all these ideas come from, right? This is where I'm able to challenge the status quo. This is where I'm able to not go the con conventional path. This is where I'm able to quote guys like Ralph Waldo Emerson. I was only able to do that through reading all the books that he made us read. It was by force at first, and then I had a liking to it. I had this yeah. I had a passion for it. Same thing with me. More often. <laughs> yeah. And so I want to. I really want to highlight reading as something that has led to um, to where I am right now. And I, I still, I really do urge people to read more, but there's two types of reading, right? Uh, so whenever I tell people to read, they start reading a lot of books, but mm. they don't gain any knowledge and don't really practice anything. Um, they read books like they read magazines and mm. you cannot approach some of the great books like that. If a guy has taken 20 years to put a piece of, uh, I want to call it art together art, and you yes. read it in one week, and then you tell me you're done one week you're done reading a book that <laughs> you cannot possibly get anything from that so reading took a lot and um 
funny enough, when it comes to the leadership stuff and how I've been able to have a few leadership roles, playing sport in school really was a game changer. Something like that, just playing a game of rugby. I'll, I'll mention rugby because uh, the yeah, Springboks are playing against New Zealand. Uh, Ooh, the Rugby tonight. World Cup is tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow okay. Night, uh, and it's the World Cup final. And so I used to dream to be part of a, uh, to wear that green and gold jersey from South Africa, right? To be part of the Springbok rugby team. And, and it's only because of that if you see what rugby did to our country in 94, uh, post-apartheid, it really mm -hmm, changed the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we had this dream of, you know, we all want to be part of that. And so I always bring rugby up as something that helped me in my leadership journey. So sport yeah. reading really has, um, I think, made me the person I am as well. That's, that's yeah. fantastic. I'm happy. See, I, did, I didn't know you were going to say that, but now I am happy I ask you, more about yeah. you what next what's next <laughs> what is it about you know yeah the in your bio i saw it say you say you bridge the gap between good and great with a simple frame, framework of think plan and execute mm. okay so mm. Tell us more about that framework. Um, so, you know, most frameworks start as something that isn't a framework, right? Okay. You, you, realize, you, realize, you realize, no, I've been, I've been doing something over and over and over, but why is it not something I can actually apply, um, almost make it re a religious uh, uh, process and application of it? And that's, that's really how the, and as I call it now, the TPE framework came along, right? Is I realized there's a point in my life where I was just thinking, thinking a lot um of course with the reading what, what tends to happen with reading is you read a lot so then you think a lot and you ponder what you're reading a lot and so ideas come up but you don't action on them now you've got all these ideas in your head and you keep on reading more researching more thinking a lot more which there's value in right but if you don't start then taking all these tangible thoughts and ideas putting them onto paper and finding ways to execute on them um you've got a, you've got a problem now then the level two of that is the planning part uh, and whether you're a startup, whether you're just a, a person trying to build their career, we do a lot of planning. We sit down and we can plan a whole year. Next year, you know, it's, now it's 2024, it's about to uh, reach us. We also have to plan next year and six months. I want to do this in, in, the, in the eight months and in, in the 12 months. But a lot of us also stop there, just there. We do the first part and we do the second part and that's it. We never really get to the execution of it. And mm. if you don't execute on those ideas and those plans, then you, you, you're just wasting your time as a yeah. person because you can think as much as you want. It, it will not do anything. You can plan as much as you want. It will not Nothing. do anything for you as well. But until you execute, it's really redundant. And then the, 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 and the, the reason why I, I started seeing it as, as more of a framework is that if you do one of the other uh, without them as a whole, there's still a broken piece to it that you haven't done right. And that's where things kind of fall apart. So if you go straight and go execute, which some people do a lot, and sometimes you're lucky and you went straight into it and it worked out, but half the time you execute and then you realize, oh no, I should have actually thought more about it. Or you execute and you go, I should have planned it a little bit more. So it's simple. And I think I said it's a simple, it's a simple, very simple framework. Yeah. It's not easy, but it's a simple framework that you can apply in a variety of things, whether it be in your personal life or work on business. And that can really change things and, and, and ultimately um, get you from where you are or where you can, to where you can be. And that's the whole good to great ideology as well. Mm -hmm. See, <clears throat> when you started, you, just, you said you think and then you write. Yeah. See, that's something that many people don't realize the power of writing things down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nowadays, uh, I I don't write, but I type it up. I, I type it a lot. Okay. Yeah. And uh, my phone, I use WhatsApp a lot. <laughs> I used yeah. to have another device that had an, a WhatsApp account. So I write things every time I I I am I, I sit down. Thoughts are always going through my head. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just open my WhatsApp, go to that account, type it, send it to the account. So on my WhatsApp, the the person who gets the most messages from me is me 
<laughs> you know? So yeah. I write a lot because yeah. I think a lot, you know? Now, execution is something I still have a little pro problem with, okay? The most But difficult. I know, I know without execution, nothing will ever happen. Mm -hmm. Nothing will ever happen. So tell me, what kind of clients do you work with? So, uh, of course, if you're a big company, chances are you, you're going to go out and, 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 and get some consulting from your other bigger companies, your, yeah. your McKinsey's and your Bain's or whatever the case is. And it's perfect. But I thought these startups on the African continent, we're starting businesses as it becomes something popular where people realize that in order for me to finance myself, my life being my family, um, I need to obviously then start something, start my own business. But they either lack some of the knowledge to start and operate a business effectively, to market themselves, to scale. And I realized there was a gap. These people cannot afford to hire uh, multiple Those people. Big, big, they, yep. Exactly. They, but they can't even afford to hire other people around them, like full time. Mm. So what, what I then determined was that, Babu, you've been reading all these books. You've read all these books, watched all these videos. You've done all these things. So I've done my thinking. I've done yeah. my planning as well. But I haven't been able to execute as well. So I was like, they... I've started something and they can have um, or, or I would, would appreciate to have the skills, the knowledge, the expertise that I have. And then together we can then execute on it, right? Mm -hmm. And so my main focus is always and carries on to being um, individual, solo. There's this new word. I don't, I don't really like it when they say solopreneur because I don't think anyone is yeah. like, um, self-made like that. But the individual, um, you know, self uh, or, uh, or, or founders that start something themselves and build on. Those are the guys that usually I, I go, look, what you're doing is really great. I've got these level of expertise and I'm going to help you go from where you are to where you yeah. can be. Um, and because you cannot afford to hire someone full time, in six months, we'll do your marketing this way. Or in six months, we'll try to figure out your operations. In six months, we'll help you with your finance. And yeah. I realized that there was something with just helping smaller businesses and uh, the startups on the, on the African ecosystem. Uh, because business to us Africans, as much as it's, it's not a new thing, the way we do business today is new. The digitalization of the way exactly. we do business is new. And this is what we need to kind of, I don't want to say necessarily teach um, people, but help them understand it and then they can apply it. And it's the only way we'll be, we'll be, we'll be able to compete against, you know, different economies and, and, and beyond. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, the way, I mean, hey, Africans have always been business people. Okay, that's what we, what we do on a daily basis. But we need now we need to formalize the process of building a business. Okay, mm -hmm. so that it will last beyond the current ger generation. Exactly. Okay, most exactly. most businesses die once the owner or the founder is gone. Okay, yeah. we, we need to have a way of pro, uh, of prolonging a business, and mm. that's why we need to do it formally. You know, exactly. This is exactly. setting up businesses, mm. doing finding uh, uh, financials and all that. Yeah, yeah, and and and, and you'd be surprised. And I mean, it, of course, as I said, it's something that's really new to us as a way of doing business. But you'd be surprised mm. how many people don't have that knowledge. Yeah. We, we tell people to start businesses, but we don't tell them how to start the businesses. Uh, it's the same way we tell them to go study and go learn and, and go educate themselves, but don't tell them what, what skills they need in the future to be able to do that. So I think we, um, we, we, we've missed something, a little gap in between there where we said, yeah. go start businesses, but we're saying, um, let's find out how and, and you know, the, the value of those businesses. And not only that, um, there's so many concepts when you go into the business world that people have, just, just don't really know about. And it's, yeah. it's like, if you start a business, right, are you going to focus on product first? So it's, it's okay. I'm going to sell t-shirts. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's just a product. And first time entrepreneurs, a lot of them focus on, on just that, right? And then there's, there's obviously levels now where people that are more experienced know that think about the value chain, think about distribution, um, go back up to even building an ecosystem where you're not just now selling eggs, you own the farm and mm. you own the chickens that, you know, so as, as Africans, we don't, we don't see all of that. We still go, okay, I want to sell, sell eggs, um, but I'm buying them from someone else where's the chickens. And then they are probably getting those chickens from someone. You know, it's this, this line that we have in part, like, determined. And we can honestly go up the value chain and have our own ecosystems as Africans where 
I own a farm or our family owns a farm and on our farm we have the chickens the chickens give us the eggs and those eggs then go out into the market or the supermarket and that those are models that the, the ordinary um, startup founder on, yeah. on the continent wouldn't think about and these are the things we need to just educate them on it's like okay you're doing a really good business selling the end product but have you thought about how you can go up the value chain so you can build something that lasts like you mentioned, generational. Yeah. Um, and when you just sell the product, it won't really go that far. But when you build an ecosystem like that, then you're almost guaranteed to see that longevity. Yeah. Good, good. So what have we, what have we seen yeah. in the environment? How yeah. have uh, young people like you, how have, have you guys taken up that mental of building things? Mm. there's a lot happening on the african continent fortunately there's a lot happening on the continent um uh, I, I think the internet has changed the game being able to go online learn a skill and then apply it almost also almost immediately um find a way to do it so there's a lot of younger people now starting a lot more things starting a lot more projects collaborating on projects um but I just want to highlight this because I've seen it as, as a problem that also the younger people probably would appreciate me to bring it up and so they can, you know, have a discussion that people out there can hear is there are some countries and some, some it's better at some countries and, and worse than some where access to capital is still a problem on the continent. Yeah. It's not a new problem. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be a problem that will last. The banks know it. The uh, investors, pe people know that it's a problem, right? So again, we are urging young people to start things and they're starting amazing projects but then they lack the, the financial resources and capital to mm. scale those amazing projects. Mm. And fortunately for us, we've got, uh, and, and this has been, I was very fortunate to sit in a room with um, some of the higher executives at the MasterCard Foundation. Okay. Doing amazing work, amazing work on the continent. And we need more of those people to come in and see that the young potential, the young, the young um, people that are working on these things. So just give them a little more funding here or just, not even if it's direct funding, and grants but necessarily just give them the right uh, education as well um, as people that now have founded something uh, they have all these amazing programs that students and other people can go through so we are seeing a bit of it but it's still a problem where um, yeah. entrepreneurs uh, young founders are starting things but don't have that access to, to capital well, see, um, yeah the, the, the truth of the matter is this um, entrepreneurs don't get funded by banks no. see no bank in the no. world funds an entrepreneurial venture because yeah. banks will only fund businesses that are going concern okay mm. businesses that have one to three years of financials that shows them that shows the progress Okay, in fact, they they have revenue, yeah, revenue stream. Banks will fund it, mm -hmm. but see this this is why entrepreneurship is not a game that a lot of people play. Yeah, okay, there's a lot yeah. of risk. Okay, <laughs> and that that's why I'm I I I laugh when. I hear people demonize entrepreneurs who succeed because the majority of ventures that entrepreneurs try fail. You see, mm -hmm. people don't see when entrepreneurs are banging their head against the wall mm. after failure, after failure, after failure. See, people only see them when they finally succeed and then they start making money. And mm -hmm. then people start saying, oh, they are this, that, that. Okay? Mm. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Mm. And yes, maybe, maybe uh, the states can make the the task the task codes easier so that major entrepreneurs or companies will not try to evade the, the tax. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah. But I'm not one of those people who blame entrepreneurs who have succeeded because mm. just having a big business that hires people is a is a win-win for society. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. And uh, oh. yes, I I I am happy that young people are trying new things. Yeah. Yes, it's difficult. It's not easy. <laughs> it is not mm -hmm. easy. Mm -hmm. It's very very hard. But the more young people try, the better they get, and mm. the more success they will have. You know. Yeah. yeah. I think, and and just to add on that, I, I, I think that young people today are seeing that. I think there was a, there was a generation, and uh, I hope the older generation doesn't 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 uh, <laughs> come at me for this. But there's an older generation that almost felt that they were inferior to maybe the West or the 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 the, the UK or the other uh, foreign nations. They felt that they were we weren't as good, maybe or smart enough, or the, whatever the case was. Um, but the younger generation now sees uh, the U.S. and goes, they're not smarter than us. They have more money, but they're not smarter than us. And so yeah. what, we, what, are, what are we doing as a generation? We, we are coming up with ideas and going, how can we still make it happen regardless of the fact that we don't have the millions of dollars that they have? And a lot of that is happening right now. There's that whole mindset shift where Africans are finally recognizing the power that we have as Africans as well, uh, as the younger generation. We're not waiting until we have permission to start a company or we have permission to do the next big thing to us. We are coming up with ideas and almost on the day executing them um, because we, 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 we finally recognize that in order for us to take this continent where we want to be, to uh, build the lives that we want to have, we are going to like, have to really double down and, and take some action. Uh, so we, we can't blame uh, the government for not giving us funds. Rather, we go, okay, the government will, won't give us funds, so how do we still make this happen? And mm -hmm. I think that's the mindset shift that Africans are coming and the younger generation has now. Um, yeah. And again, the online space has helped a lot because they watch content that, that inspires them to do this. Um, they get to produce content and get it out there as well. So it's just the digital space has done a lot. And it, it, it ties in with my... Uh, when you are studying at the African Leadership University, uh, just to bring that up, they they don't they don't believe in um, majors. They believe in missions. Mm. And when 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 I was asked about what my mission has to be, because everyone gets to write their mission, right? My mission was that I wanted to connect every African or put internet in every uh, African home so that they so we can bridge the the digital divide. Because on that, on the con and it's a big problem, big it's a huge problem. So I'm not saying I'm the one to solve it. But I'm like, I'll do whatever it maybe takes. Maybe you are to get there. <laughs> it's like, you know, you never know. So I'm I'm saying I want to do whatever it takes to get it. And that's that's my I'd say I want to say life mission. Why? Because I think it's 30% of the continent that's really connected to reliable, affordable internet. 70% yes. unconnected. That is something that should shock the world. Really, 70%. No, 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 no. <laughs> see, see the, the, the good thing is this. <laughs> Africa is a virgin land. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The business. So mm. you guys have yeah. the opportunity to take yeah. it over. You know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But you just that's the and that's and that's it really. You go if seven percent of the of the continent is 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 not connected, and I come from humble beginnings, but internet changed everything for me. I was able to learn more, read more. Um you know, get a lot more knowledge that empowered me. And it reminds me of that story of, I don't know, it's a Netflix movie, a uh, documentary on the boy who harnessed the wind. Uh, okay. We, that, 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 that for me was an amazing story. But the fact that he had to sneak into a library to learn how to, you know, <laughs> a bit of the scientific things that he yeah. needed to do to build a windmill. I'm yeah. saying that every African can have the opportunity by having uh, internet access. Because with that, they can learn how to do windmills. They can learn farming. They can learn all these things with a, a screen and a bit of internet connectivity, connectivity. So to me, bridging the digital divide on the continent is what's going to get us to where I think the African continent can go. Mm. Um, mm. That's literally what the world has, I'd say, on edge with us right now, because I think in every community, in every household, there is that boy or that girl who could have harnessed the wind as well. Yeah. And yeah. We, need to, we need to do better at getting those resources to them. You shouldn't be feeling to the need to sneak into a library at school to solve a problem <laughs> like that. You know? See, see, see all, all those things have still happen everywhere in the world. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. It still happened. Everyone, see, you mentioned earlier that the older generation used to think the West were better than them. Mm. Okay. I will tell you this. Once upon a time, the West used to see themselves as inferior mm -hmm. to the Arabs. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And see, that's why I, when, whenever I hear people, young Africans complaining that the West sees us like this. <laughs> see, I tell them, hey, Hmm. See there, that that line, every book on that line is history. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh Will Duran, who you quote, uh, we're going to talk about him. He has one, two, three, four, four books, big books in there. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, he's he's a he he was a great historian. So I I loved his uh story of of uh, civilization yeah so yeah. see the arabs used to think that the europeans were barbaric mm. yeah that's that's true <laughs> yeah. yeah okay the arabs yeah. were more modern mm -hmm. okay the europeans were still in villages mm. When Baghdad was a booming city, so it's it's it happens. Yeah, you see, and so, I, but I think we are we are slowly seeing that narrative change. Obviously, with a new generation coming up, exactly. now, we, are, we are starting to see that we we are not inferior to we are see, not we are not see, behind. Th this any. is this yeah. is life. Okay. Yeah. So I want I want young people to see that it has happened to every all the exactly. groups see yeah. the same thing has happened to all the groups yeah so yeah that's why i encourage people to read history history i was about just to read say history. that i was about to say yeah when you mentioned that i was like reading history is something we don't emphasize enough and we, we should we really don't should because, because um, when you read history yeah. you 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 stop seeing yourself as a victim because mm -hmm. every other group in the world has been victimized at one time or the other. Yeah, yeah. And, and it goes beyond that. It really does go beyond that because history, history is very it's fascinating, really. Um, people always say that history uh, uh, always repeats itself. That's one point that you need to think about. And if you look at the history and you read, you go, ah, this has happened before, the cycles in history. Yeah. But not only that now, there's a, there's a part of history where in order to prepare yourself for the future in order for, for yourself right now to understand what's happening in the present you actually have to know the history and it does sound counterintuitive you know it, it doesn't sound like it should make sense why should i learn history to understand the future or where we are but the reality is in order to do that you need to actually read a lot about and understand the history that we come from yeah yeah and if you don't read the history you will repeat it mm -hmm. that's it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway the quotes yeah yeah i saw it on your linkedin profile we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not an act it's but a habit end quote mm. uh mm. will durant will durant yeah so, yeah so, talk you to me about in that. in in life you you there's so is this thing is whether you it's a song or a movie, or a book that you either read, you pick up, you notice, and it, I don't want to say, but it really does. It almost changes your life. And for me, was, that quote is one that really changed my life. Uh, because you, I, I think I would do things, I would do one thing really well, and then I'd say, no, I, that, was, that was an excellent result or excellent product or whatever the case is. But then you'd be mediocre at everything else. You step back, whether it be on, as I said, I, I, was, a, I was a sport player, so whether it be on the field, anywhere you go right business your personal life uh, how how many things are you actually just doing enough to get by and then occasionally doing it really well uh, and then that framing that as your excellence and i thought when i read that quote I, I i said to myself and i thought so i've been doing all these acts of excellence and i thought that 
um, I uh, valued excellence and I, I had this excellence uh, philosophy where I strived for excellence. But I was like, what, how much of what I'm actually doing on the day to day would would I look at and be honest with myself and say, this is really what striving for excellence is all about. Um, and so w- when I read the quote, and I really, it's one of my favorites, uh, I realized that the things I do every single day are what will lead um, to that excellence, are what will yeah. lead to me being the leader I want to be. Um, and it's not doing one good thing or one great thing this month and then once again next month and then once again, uh, maybe the next day I do something really well, but it's every single day doing the necessary things that I think for me made, it, made all the difference. Uh, because I think people uh, plan their goals in a certain way where you think about doing something big or really good uh, at a certain point in time. And uh, for me, that quote really always says, no, Bob, you don't have to wait till that end goal to do something really great. What are you doing today that gets you to where you want to go? What are you doing today that really proves that you are this person that's driven um, and, and, and really values excellence above all? And so that it's really one of those quotes that have, I'd say are almost ingrained in me. They, they, they live in me. Um, it's one of the ones I don't even mention that often to people because I, I almost feel like it's just, it's just part of me. Wherever I go, I carry it uh, in everything I do. Yeah. <laughs> great, yeah. great, great. Yeah. See, I, I have a quote um, that I heard from a mentor about uh, seven years ago, no, eight, yeah. eight years ago. He says, how you do anything is oh. how you do everything. Oh. See, and I speak that quote maybe every day at least 10 times. Powerful. Uh, my daughters are, are tired <laughs> of it. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, see, I, I tell you, it, uh, it has exposed me. Yeah. Okay. Every time I do things in a mediocre way, I say, uh uh-uh. uh. This is not who you want to be. Okay. Because mm. how you do anything will be how you do all, 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 all other things. So Powerful. you need to do anything yeah. you do the way you want to continue doing every other thing. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So, so we're making it a habit. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, making it a habit. It's a Make ritual it a habit. of some sort. Yeah. yeah. It has to be. Yeah. It has to be. Um, yeah. I, ho- I hope your daughters do listen to this, by the way. And, and, well, and, and I, wanna, I, see, I want to just tell them, if, if they do listen, is to say that there are things that my father used to say that I used to find annoying or I was like, oh, my word, he's saying it again. Um, things like, remember, readers are leaders, do this and that. And when, when I hear it and when I heard it as a child, you know, every single day, I used to be like, oh, my word, here we go again. And now it's some of the things that I really value and, and, and treasure so much because he was right. And it's, <laughs> he was right. See. And it's helped me so much um, because whenever I have moments where I go, oh, I can't pick up another book. And I, I remember that voice in, in my head when he says, read as a leader, right? And I go, I want to be a leader. I'm a leader, so I'm going to read that book. And it's just because of things like that. And I'm pretty sure that one day, and don't realize it now, but one day they'll go, wait, wait, wait. And that's, that's that, why I see it. Exactly. It'll be like, ah, okay. like, oh, he, he used to tell us that, you know, how we do things is, so, uh, and and it just instantly that will just come back. And that is whatever why we, I say yeah. it every time today. See, <laughs> amazing. My my yeah. father used to tell me because hey, I used to say I forget things things a lot. Okay. Yeah. My father told me you only forget what you want to forget, <laughs> and I hated it. I mean, I, I say no, I didn't want to forget it, but it ju- just happened. Tell me now. You only forget mm. what you want to forget. Mm. Okay. That, and so. that's that's another thing I say to my daughter, and they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. <laughs> but there is so much value in it though. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you're doing it intentionally. Oh yeah. Um I I, I never I, when I look back, I don't know if my father was doing it intentionally or if it was just something that he believed in. So I just wanted to just drill it in us. Um and maybe didn't even realize we was doing it. But the fact that you're doing it intentionally as well saying it over and over and over to make sure that they really get it and it sticks. Yeah. See, even if yeah. they hate it, it's ingrained in them. Exactly. When when yeah. they need it, 
most, it will come out. No, of course. It will, it will. And they'll, they'll appreciate it later. Oh, um, they will. And it's funny, I, I used to be, a, I used to be the, 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 the child who hears people talking about their parents and says, no, no ways. I'm not going to remember this. I won't, I won't. And then now I'm, I'm at that point where I'm, I'm almost transitioning to everything that they told me about what my parents did or how my parents brought me up is how it's going to have an impact on me later. And then I used to think, people are, these people can't be serious. How is my parents forcing me to read or not do this or come back to the house before dark? How is it going to help me with anything? Um, and now you look back and I go, huh. Well, it makes sense why we did that. <laughs> it makes sense why he made us do that. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's that's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Now, you see, you guys uh, are plenty, abundant. Okay? <laughs> Young people, see, that's why I tell you, you guys have, uh, you, you, this our continent is yours. Okay? Yeah. But, um, Many young Africans have uh, lost hope. Mm. They are not doing much to develop themselves. Mm. Uh, what do you think is responsible for that loss of hope and how can they revive it? You see me, I say mm. how they will revive it because mm. uh, nobody can do it for them. No, no. Okay. No. We, we can we can we can advise, but they yeah. need to do it. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, and we, we could we could list all the problems, right? We can list media, we can list governments, we can list all these things. Um, but a big factor and a big part that I found was storytelling, narratives, narratives. So the narrative right now is there's no hope for Africa. And and uh, yeah, as my, I can stand here and say that no. I think there's hope for Africa and I can preach it and speak about it, but it's the majority you and I are referring to now. The yeah. people that have really lost hope because no one is giving them any other story that they can kind of live off. All they hear is the same things. Your country is the highest unemployment rate. Your country has the most this. There won't be jobs in the future in your country. You guys will have this problem. And I think we've been speaking about so many problems, which there are. I will not take away that there are these problems on the African continent. But I really wish that we were sharing more stories of hope more stories of success, more stories of Africans doing amazing things within the continent, not just leaving. Uh, because I, I can sit here and have this conversation with you as a Pan-Africanist, mm. but I haven't always been that. In school, okay. I had a dream. I had a dream to go to the US and to further my studies there, to get a degree there, to get a job there, and to live there. And then <laughs> when it was in the US, it was the UK. That was the other dream. <laughs> go to the UK, to study in the UK, to live in the UK. And then I thought of Asia even. I was like, ah, oh, maybe I can even go to the Asian market. But do you think anywhere at that point I thought I can go to Africa, stay in my own continent, go to East Africa, to Kigali, to Rwanda, and do something there, go to Nairobi, go to Lagos in Nigeria, amazing places. But I didn't have that in me. Why? Because no one was telling me about these places. No one was telling me about all the good things happening at these places. All that was being mm. told to me was that there aren't enough opportunities on the African continent, yeah. that the government was bad, that I should leave as soon as I can. This is the story I was hearing. And then what I was seeing as well, I'm seeing people leaving. I'm seeing this brain drain of really amazing minds telling us that now they're living here, they've moved over to here. And uh, for me, to those Africans, to those young Africans who have lost hope, and I have friends like this, by the way. I went to, in South Africa, because South Africa's got this problem right now. I have friends that I have to fight, almost fight for them to stay in South Africa. They have plans to go to Australia, have plans to go to China, their plans to go to the UK, to the US, and I have to try to convince them to stay on the continent. Mm. I have to come to Kigali and, and, and kind of have this almost a proof to say that, guys, there are better places on the continent. You can, before you leave, um, try experience try more of it. Try yeah, Exactly. And I've been struggling. You know, you ask me, what, what can we tell them? Uh, how, do, how do I go? It's just, I've been struggling so much to help, to tell my own friends, people that are close to me to say, guys, here's a reason to stay. And we, I think, as a collective, have not given the youth enough reasons to see or have that hope. But it's stories, it's conversations like this, firstly, and it's sharing the stories um, of, 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 I want to say, success stories of people doing amazing things on the continent that will change it. Um, but it's going to be a big factor. It's going to be changing a narrative. Yeah. And for me, changing a narrative can only happen through better storytelling. Okay. 
Yeah. That's true. That's that's very very true. Now, yes, we need to tell a bet. We need to tell better stories mm. about uh, Africa. But for me, I think something stories. But I think we need to see ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. not just as africans as human beings ah uh, ah uh. you see when we see ourselves as human beings then the the range of stories mm-hmm. increases we can now see the story of the entrepreneurs who built America the greatest yeah. country ever on our planet yeah we can see their stories and we can see us doing the same thing in Africa exactly you see yeah. that is that is powerful isn't it? yes <laughs> just like you say yeah. narrative see no, the, this narrative about us being Africans and yeah. they being Europeans and they being Asians is also part of the destruction. It is. It is. We can't, we can't wow. see them and see ourselves in them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned it. I'm so glad okay. you mentioned it. See, yeah. we, I tell people, I've mentioned this on this pl- uh, on this part, uh, podcast. Yes, I host this beautiful po- podcast. I'm African. But I yeah. do this as an African because African is behind. Mm-hmm. I see myself, first and foremost, as a human being. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, Powerful. see, I want more of us to see ourselves as humans yeah and pick up pick things from anywhere else where people Mm. have done something yeah pick examples anywhere else and bring it here adapt them to the environment and implement Mm. Mm, 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 mm. That yes, we have people doing that in the tech uh, space. Okay, yeah, yeah. We we have we have we have people doing that in the music industry, film industry, but we need more and more people to do that. Mm. And like you said, you are who you are today because of the books you read. Mm. I'm sure. I'm sure. Maybe at least sixty percent of these books are not written by Africans. No. Okay. <laughs> See, I, I I read a lot of books written by Africans, but yeah. the majority of the books I read were written by Europeans. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's true. See, I I have always seen myself as human, and whatever they write in wherever they are, they are from. I just see myself in them. Yeah. So I need, we need more people okay. to see ourselves yeah. in our brothers and sisters from everywhere in the world. That is, that is I'm, I'm glad you said it. And, and the way you put it together is, is, is inspiring because uh, South Africa is one of those nations. I mean, now we're the rainbow nation and welcome mm. everyone, right? But before that, it was black, white, colored, whatever. We had yep. these categories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. These categories. And growing up, I was born just post-apartheid, so I, I missed it. But even growing up, you were still a black child going to a white school. That is it. And I was fortunate enough to be afforded the opportunity to go to a uh, so-and-so white school. But mm. you can imagine what happened to you as a black child getting to a white school. <laughs> that inferiority complex again. Right? Yeah. It's this term that you didn't see like you belonged. You didn't see like you can do what they can do. And uh, for me, what you just mentioned is, is powerful because I had to think like that. 
I have to not see myself as a black child. Yeah, um, like a child. I just see myself as, as a child. child yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it helped me with sports. Sports like rugby were a white sport. Yeah. But I was like, I can play rugby because I'm just another child as well. Yeah, I can play rugby. Exactly. I, I don't have to go play soccer because I'm a black child. So all the because the black children play soccer and the white children play rugby. And it was this this whole thing where even as a young person, I thought that there's something wrong here. I should be able to go play rugby as a normal human being. And a child yeah. was passionate about the sport. And so that was just mentioned, is, I think is something powerful that I've never really uh, thought about in the way you say it or, or maybe framed it that way, is that we really have to see ourselves as, because um, when we use the, the terms like we use like African, and it's nice to be proud of your, 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 yeah. your culture. Yeah, I'm, pr I'm, pr I'm proud of it. I, I am I'm, I'm African. It's good to stand like that. But what with that, what, what other like narratives what other um I mean, stereotypes whatever what else do you take with you when you really stick with something like that only and not see yourself as a as a whole um and and i think there's, there's a lot to that because a very important conversation now that i really really hope people have of is people are are turning to this pan-africanism which is great i'm a big guy who's pro pan-africanism etc but i'm saying let's not cut off the waste and say, let's not read the Western media, let's not watch the Western <laughs> media because we're pan-Africanists who only consume African content. I'm like, hey, the, the, the unicorns are from the US. So if you want to build a unicorn, you have to learn from how they built their unicorn. Right? Okay. And you, you learn about all these parts where you go, as much as I want to be pan-African and, and I really want to do, consume things on the, on the continent, but there's just certain things that they have done better and we can learn from it. And until we also just see it as that, until we go, it's not that they're American. It's not that they're white. It's not that they're this. It's just that they've achieved something significant and we can learn from them because we're all just human beings. And that was what you said about not seeing ourselves as African or American or the, the English did this or the Asians did this, but rather as human. Human beings. Then, see, then, Babu, then, yeah, yeah. I will tell you this. <laughs> Let me just limit it to to middle of uh, last uh, millennium. Yeah. In the middle of the last millennium, the Arabs were the big dogs. Science, they were the big dogs. Mm. When they were doing experiments in science, mm -hmm. the Europeans were in villages. Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. And then some something happened. They stopped doing. In fact, before they, they, they adopted science, they learned from who? The Greeks. Okay. And then the Europeans gathered the books that the uh, Arabs wrote. Books yeah. in science, in mathematics. Okay. And they used that to learn. Yeah. And then they surpassed the Europeans. And then they became the big, big, the big dogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, this is, this is the history of human beings. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay, if we go back a few more millennia, we'll find out there were other people who were the big dogs but in, the, in those were. era. Yeah. Okay? But all of us, in, we can go back to Egypt. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but all of us has contributed in a little ways mm, mm. To, to bring the world, our world, to where it is today. Yeah. Yeah. See, and yes, even though there's a, a, a big disparity yeah. from continent to continent, country to country, one thing that is certain is that as a whole, humanity has progressed. As a whole. We have. We have. You know, yeah. A hundred years ago, lifespan of people, let's say Africans, were in the early 
early 30s. Yeah. 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 That's the truth. Today, I'm I'm already 50. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have I have, have surpassed the last span a hundred years ago of our of, of 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 an average African by yeah. 20 years. Yeah. My grandparents died in in the, in the 90s. My father mm. is nearly 80. Mm. So we have progressed as a, have. As, as a group of people, as yeah. human beings. We definitely have. We, we, need, to, uh, we need to adopt humanity yeah. and to learn from everybody who has ever done anything better than you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See, if we refuse to learn from them, say, oh, they're this, so we won't learn from them. Okay. <laughs> Who loses? We. <laughs> we do. Certainly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, nobody else will lose but us. No. No. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway, I hope, I hope uh, more of, more and more young Africans uh, are like you will become like you yeah no i think it's a it's a trend that and again i go back to the whole storytelling thing where Mm. when you see uh, people like you or people around your age group or your generation uh, saying certain things doing certain things you almost have more i want to say hope you see you, you are more relatable to them as well so you're able to go if they can do it then i can too and and that's also why I've always just tried to get out there as much as I can get out there. Um, I in, in the future, you know, to be uh, doing a lot more in terms of not just working with a, a company here or a startup here. How do we start going on a uh, bigger scale of talking to a lot more younger people, a lot more, so that by the time they get to a certain age or point, they go, we are ready to go and take things on from here onwards because we were told the right stories. We were told um the right things we were given a different narrative and idea that i honestly didn't get i had to go i'd say search it myself i had to go find it but how many people are actively going to go out there and try find this podcast how many people are going to go out there and try find that book not enough because they don't care they don't they don't yeah. uh, they don't they, there's no there's no value they go why must i do that when i can barely put on food on the table you know there's this things we have to think about and go uh, the more we have these conversations, the more it goes out there, the more that they can hopefully see and go, no, there's a way out of this. And if that person can do it and uh, and I can relate to him because I have a similar story, then so can I. Yeah, and I think that's the value of it. Yeah, see, that, that's why I love to talk to you. This podcast is not for only ultra successful people. No, 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 no. This podcast yeah. is for anyone who is doing something. Yeah. Okay. To add value in their, in their, in their community. Okay. And I have people, people like you, young person who is doing something Mm. to inspire other young people. Because, Hey, if I, if I, if I try very hard, I can get some of those big wigs to, come here, talk to me. And then we we'll only, only talk about the same thing that people like you have heard before. Yes, yeah. the big wigs. Okay? No, but yeah. I want everyone, no matter what level they are, to share this platform, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, see, I love uh, reading books. Okay? And I know yeah. you do. So please recommend five books. Okay. Hmm. Five, only five. Yeah. Okay. Let's 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 see. Let's see. I will I will probably speak about the let me think the top top five for my end that I really, really have changed my life. Uh I'll t- I'll start with a book by Alex Banyan. I think he's uh he's written a book called The Third Door. Amazing hmm. book. Um I've so never, Alex, I've never heard of it. That's a, that's a good one. Alex Banyan is a, is a great, great, great author. And because it's called what? Of, the, the book is what? The third, the third, 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 okay. 
Yes. So just to break the philosophy of the book quickly, uh, before I jump into the other one, yeah, yeah. he says that the, 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 the first door is, and he uses this um, going to the nightclub analogy. It's very relatable because it's like, uh, when you go to the club at night, the, the first door where everyone has this long queue around and everyone's waiting. Um, and the second door is where maybe you know the bouncer. Mm -hmm. um, but the <laughs> third door is the one at the back. That okay. No one knows it even exists. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that, and so he explains his philosophy and how, how we can approach this, uh, your career, etc. is don't use the first door. So applying to jobs with your CV, etc. might not get you anywhere. The second door is maybe doing the HR person. He basically says the third door is finding some value elsewhere that you can pitch to the CEO who can then recommend you. You know, this whole line of how to approach these things differently by using the third door. Amazing okay. book. Good. Amazing book. Good. Yeah. And then I'm going to mention a few classics that have changed my life that I hope everyone does or has to read at a point in time. Mm. Uh, one is How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dale Carnegie. You, just, you can't guess. go wrong with that. He's, yeah. he's, he's, what, what it's, it's a great he's book. He's done it a lot, by the way. If you start with his book, the, the How to Win Friends, and just carry on reading everything, a lot of the other stuff I wrote, amazing. Um, and then one that I've read one too many times and one that my father made me read, actually, uh, many times as well, Think and Grow Rich. Okay. Napoleon Hill. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know, it's stock standard books, but these are the books you read, not um, like I spoke about earlier, magazine. No. These are the books you read the first time, you go back, you make notes the second time, you go back the third time, and you read something and you go, no, have I read this before? Surely it wasn't here the last time. How did I miss it? Yeah. These are the type of books that you read over and over and over, and I'm glad you have them on your shelf. It just I, makes I sense. Read, to have I read them. that book. I read the book <laughs> about... Uh, Eight years ago, for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had to get the audio to be listening to it as I drive. You know, in fact, that's that's the book that made me sign up for audiobooks. Yeah, you know, yeah. And the mentor who who says uh, how you do anything is how you do everything was mm. the one that introduced me to that book powerful book yeah powerful book. I, it's one of those books where i mean a lot of books are like, like life-changing but it's one of those books that will really uh, yeah. change your life um especially um, whether it's actually personal or uh, professionally driven it's if you pick it up you won't be the same after you read that yeah. book without a doubt um and then i'm gonna go a bit on the philosophy side of things yeah and, good um for me meditations oh okay religious, yeah yeah that mm -hmm that um, was one of those books where I just kept seeing it everywhere and I was like, What's, what are people going on about with this meditation <laughs> guy? It's, come on, we're looking at ancient, ancient times. Can oh! I even relate to this man? Marcus Aurelius, you are, a, first of all, you're an emperor. Um, I can't even relate Whoa. to you. What are you? <laughs> yeah. What am I reading here? And I picked up that book and again, another book where you go, this is an emperor and he's yeah. telling you to, I don't know, <laughs> to like, Almost, he almost brings himself back down to a human being, like you said earlier. See, he, 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 he was a human, human being. being. Yeah. And then you go, this is an emperor of, oh, oh my word. He's of the a, emperor of, of Rome. A great empire. The greatest, yeah. exactly. That was yeah. the greatest, it's, of his time, go, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's amazing. It, it's really, it's, 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 it's crazy. So I, I absolutely recommend meditations as well. Um, again, professionally, personally, whatever it is. And with meditations, I'm just gonna, I know it's not a book that I'm highlighting right now, but journaling you we, you we spoke about writing things down yeah. earlier yeah meditations is a journal yeah this man wrote an amazing journal we can all use today yeah. and i urge i always urge people to journal a bit more write your thoughts on paper wake up in the morning write a few things um before you go to bed write a few things and it's it's, it's one of those things that will definitely change your life so yeah maybe one day if you write um you might have your own meditations that we all use as a as a as a, a, a way to live life so yeah i really urge people to write as much as they can um, and then that's number four. So the last one is the difficult, <laughs> difficult one. Um, there's so many amazing books, but I will go with... Just pick one. 40, Just pick one. 48 Laws of Power, Robert Greene. That's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And these are... If I have to speak about books that have shaped my life mm. and have kind of helped me be the person I am, think the way I think. Mm. Just mentioning in this list alone, of course, these books lead to more books, lead to more books. And yeah. before you know it, you've read a lot more books. But as a base, as a starting point, for me, um, if you pick up these, and it's for the younger generation that are, are listening into this, 
The Third Door by Alex. Yeah. That, that's a book that I recommend to every young person to read because Good. we live in a time where going through the first door isn't enough anymore. Going through the second door isn't enough anymore. So we need to constantly be thinking of how to get through that third door. Good, good, good. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we talk about young people. Okay. You mm. see, most people don't know how young you are, but you, I know. <laughs> okay. You are very young. Yeah. 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 And we are doing things. And we need to encourage other people to do things. Because they can. Okay? Certainly. So, what's your advice to fellow young people to enable them to bring value to the society? Yeah. Yeah. So, what's, what's that advice? My advice to, to young people people of my generation, people even younger than me, um, just to, and it's, it's, it's almost going to sound simple, but go after it. Just that dream, that, that idea, that vision. Um, I think the whole world, it's, and such our parents, unfortunately, our parents have, have also told us that we, you, you cannot go become an, an artist. You have to go study an engineering degree. You cannot go do this because of certain constraints that they had in their but I'm just saying, go to it, go after it, whatever it is that you as a, as a young person um, has. Because I personally don't think that I had the dreams that I had. Um, I have this, Martin Luther King said the whole, I have a dream speech, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that he had, I don't believe it that, that we have dreams like that. Sometimes the dream has you. Like okay. the dream sometimes just has you and you can't mm. run away from it. Like you just cannot run away from, if you are meant to have a podcast, everything will align so that you have that podcast and you yeah. try every other career and things don't work out because you are meant to be in front of that uh, microphone um, telling stories and sharing. So I'm just like, go after that thing, go after that one thing. So sometimes it's just that one thing that yeah. really, really you know, close to you. And I think if you go after that one thing, um, it just, it, there's so much more that comes, comes with it uh, mm. in terms of life experience, et cetera. And so, don't, don't look at what everyone else is doing and pressure yourself as a, as a young person to go, well, everyone is studying law. Let me study law. Everyone is being an engineer. Let me be an engineer. Um, I think all of us, young or old, innately know what our hearts call us to. Those dreams that have us, we, we know them, we feel them, but there's so much noise. And for the young generation, there's even more noise now. Yeah. You go on TikTok and you scroll yeah. and you see social many... media. Oh my word. You see millions of ideas being kind of thrown at you that you, you have to do this. You have to dress like this. You have to be like this. And if you don't escape that, stop, think, what does my heart really want? And then you go after that thing. Um, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy just, just to highlight this. Cause I feel like whenever I say things like go after it, go make that idea happen. People come oh. to me and say, Bobby, you didn't say it was going to be this hard. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say it was going to be this hard, but go after it. And I think no matter what the result is, going after that thing that you want mm. to have as your thing going after it will lead to so much more and if and if it's if it's not the thing and it's, it's a quote that i also uh, have written down in my wall back at home if it's not the thing it will lead you to the thing okay so it's a philosophy that i also really apply to my life so you might uh, get a job or have a conversation or get a, someone to introduce to someone and you might not feel like you made the progress that you wanted to have but if it's not the thing it will be the thing that leads you to the thing. Very good. Very That's, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, Jim Rohn. Mm. And he said this, whatever starts. Just Maybe like. you think, what if is the wrong thing? He said, mm. start. Because when you start, you find out quickly it's not the right thing. And then you turn back. Yeah. If you never start, you will never know. Yeah. Yeah. No, true. Yeah. Look, I'm, I'm just giving an example. So I think sharing an example to the younger generation listening can also say is, is for, for the longest of times, I have always had this bugging question. I wanted to know what's next. What's next in my life? What's next in education? What's next in all these different industries? And it, it really bothered me. Um, so much so that obviously I've, I've found that I'm, I'm creating a platform now called What's Next for that, that facilitated yeah. the platform to show people what's next. And I, I bring it because when I decided to, <laughs> my parents always go back to this, when I decided to leave my nice paying corporate job 
uh, to start working on it uh, just before COVID. No one has seen COVID coming, by the way. But here I was, and I had an idea. I wanted to work on this. I'm leaving my nice paying uh, finance and marketing job. And my parents said I was crazy. But I, I had it in me. I had this dream that I wanted to do it, right? And look, fate, I don't know what happened with the, with the universe. But here I, I left my job. I wanted to start this thing. COVID happened. Mm. And it changed everything, right? And at, at that point in time, I thought I should have listened to my parents. I should have listened <laughs> to everyone around me that said I must not leave my job for this thing. But here we are. COVID is gone. COVID came and go. And I, I mean, it's not entirely gone, but it came and it doesn't affect us as much anymore. And yeah. till this day, I'm able to still work on the thing that I was trying to build a yeah. few years ago yeah. because I went after it. And I saw potential enough to say, no matter what happens, I'm going to see this thing through. And I think to anyone listening, really, it's like, go after it. And something might happen like that way out of the blue something comes like COVID, like something else, uh, uh, something that's unfortunate and changes everything. And for a moment you think, ah, I listened to that podcast with Bavu and AKN, they told me to, to just start. And now I don't have a job and I don't have this. Or <laughs> <laughs> you and know, I want to make see, sure that they know. Yeah. See, I, I, I will also say this. I had a coaching platform for young yeah. Africans. Yeah. Okay. And then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. It basically shut down the platform. Yeah. And in the midst of COVID, I started this podcast. Okay. So. Uh, it's, it is an amazing story. That okay. to me is the, literally what, 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 what signifies that if some things literally just lead you to the, the, yeah. the next thing that you are meant to be doing. And you don't see it. I mean, if, if we look forward, we don't see those things, right? Yeah. No one yeah. goes, well, if I do this, then this will happen, this will happen. Uh, but Steve Jobs said it the best. You can only connect the dots when you're looking back. When exactly. Go, ah, exactly. That happened to happen for this reason. Yeah. And it's very hard to actually live life that way because you're constantly looking <laughs> forward. And you want things to work out and they're not working out, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. That's just, okay. It makes a lot more sense looking back. Yeah. yeah. Babu, uh, mm. my last question. What's your vision for Africa in the next 30 years? 30 years. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a big one. It's a big one. Um, because I can see how much my generation is doing, right? I mean, I mean, if we do 30 years, we're looking at vision 2050 and past that, right? Yeah. Just around that era. Yeah. And if you look at what's happening in, 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 in you know, whether it be governments, whether it be the younger generation coming up now, we are building. We are, we are, we are building, we are creating, we are, we are trying to, I want to say, uh, not even match what the West or whatever else is doing, but we're really trying to make a name for ourselves as Africans as well. Um, and we are, there's this beautiful uh, inter integration stuff happening. Uh, regional integration, whether it be the the South coming together and having you can travel to this place, you can you can you can, you can do business at this place without having to get a visa. Uh, I mean, these things take a very long time, but thirty years from now, I see almost um, the South together, the East together, the West together, the North together, and in between that, some form of synergy as well, where we are able to finally travel, do business continent wide, and that's just what I see as an, a brief overview of you know, staying on the continent long enough to see that happen. And I think that it will be our generation going into the leadership positions that allow that. Because there's just something, there's just something with the, I say the current leadership structures that don't see that, um, that, that, that don't want to put in certain things that kind of can implement that. And I don't know all the politics behind it, but I see that dynamically changing over the next few years. Where I go, I had a great time in Kigali, in Rwanda. How do I make it easier for South Africans to come to Rwanda? You know, it's these things that we need to think about as, as Africans. So 30 years from now, I see us being able to travel within the continent, to do business within the continent more freely than ever. Um, and that's from the just, I'd say, economic point of view. But technology-wise as well, Eco see, I see. See, people don't understand. Economic is the, is the, is the hinge. Yeah, it is. See, it's the hinge. <laughs> okay? It is. Economy connects technology, health, exactly. education, everything. Yeah. Economy. Yeah. Economy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and that's really what's going to happen, I think. Once we get that right, all the other things follow. Everything will then it's, flow. Then everything else just comes into place. And now that, you know, like you mentioned, there are different industries uh, on one advance. Because if you, are, if you are connected that way as well, 
we start asking questions like, why is Nigeria's education system way more advanced than ours? What are they doing right? But because now we, are, we have those close ties, we can go, we can learn from Nigeria. We can learn from Kigali, Nairobi, where, whatever the, the city is, whatever the country is. And it's through that integration of our continent that we'll be able to achieve that. Yeah. And so I see a lot of us really as Africans going, no, the only way to really move forward is together as a, as a, almost a unit. Um, see, and I, I, w- I wish we could, have, we, could have, we could talk about all that because yes, it's possible. It is. See, it is possible, but it is only, only if we understand why it hasn't happened now. And there's a lot that goes into it. Good. <laughs> See, and and this is the this is the for me, this is the challenge we have. Yeah. I I commented on several posts on LinkedIn today, and I yeah. mentioned in one of one of my comments, I mentioned that the challenge is that we don't step back, look yeah. deeper. And say, why is it? Why is it happening? Uh-huh. Why hasn't this happened? Exactly. See, we want something. We have been wanting that thing for the last sixty years, and mm-hmm. it hasn't happened. Yet, we are still wanting it without first stepping back and asking, why yeah. hasn't it happened? Big question. Big question. So, uh, and, the, Babu, and the answers, li- the, li- the answers, by the way, lie into the in, in the history we spoke about earlier. The exactly. History, it, exactly. You, look at, you don't look far. I'll just mention one big name. Go look at guys like Thomas Sankara, what they were saying. Go look at all the other guys in history that were on the African continent preaching this and what happened to them. And you kind of have a lot of the answers you're looking for. Okay. But, <laughs> okay. I, uh, I, that's a, that, and I really hope that one day we can have the, the conversation. Don't worry. We'll, as well. we'll talk about that it. A, we'll talk about it on the one on one basis. Huh? Or, We'll definitely have to speak about it. Um, and I can't wait to have it with you. Um, but yeah, I think just again, going back to Africa, because of the population and the next few years, we're basically only going to, I don't say double in population, but a lot more people will be on the continent. Yeah. We'll be one of the, the most populated continents um, yeah. in the future. Yeah. And, but people see problems in that. And I want to urge everyone to, to think from two sides of this. Yes, we've got more problems to worry about, but that means now as entrepreneurs, as startup founders, as you know, it is really brilliant minds coming together and trying things. That means more opportunities for us. Opportunities, yes. As Africans to solve those problems. How do yes. you solve overpopulation? How do you solve the water crises? How do you solve that? So yes, Africa 2050 and Africa 20, this will look a certain way uh, in terms of all the negatives we can think about. But there's so many positives that we can also look at and go. See, w- so without, much without, without, without problems, yeah. Uh, no progress. No. Okay. No. So, yeah. so <laughs> Babu, thank you very, very much for being a wonderful guest of the Think yeah. Big for Africa podcast. Thank you so yeah. much again. This has been a, an absolute pleasure to, to be here. And uh, I mean, I look forward to many more conversations like this between yeah. you and I. Uh, but I really urge that uh, it, that the, well, young people listening to this and I'll, I'll try my best to get it out there as well to my network to go wait 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 these are the conversations we should be having not between you and i we, we are generations apart but we're not having these conversations enough amongst each other as well yeah. mm-hmm. so amazing platform thank you for also acknowledging that um it's easy to to, to listen to the big guys who've achieved everything but it's <laughs> the young people that are still building that yeah. we need to hear more of. We're yeah. more related to them as, as, as the youth. And yeah. to me, that's 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 something I, I, I really commend you for doing. And I really appreciate Thank this you. opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. All <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Yeah. All right.